Well, if you have your Bible with you, or your iPhone, or your iPad, or whatever, just lift it up and repeat after me. I believe this is the Word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. I want to talk to you tonight uh, about relationships, and there's really, honestly, no way that I can go through all the notes, I'm telling you right up front, that I have. I may be wrong on this, I'll find out Sunday morning, but I think that what I'm supposed to do is prime the pump tonight, and then Sunday morning, go a little deeper. But through the years, I have had different messages that have centered around this, and what I've done is I believe God's kind of told me to pull together the greatest hits, you know, the high points, things that we shouldn't forget, and remind ourselves of our relationship with other people is a, a direct reflection of our relationship to the Father. If you have a person, and this person is grumpy, and I know none of you really know anybody like this, but if you know of somebody that is just grumpy and mean to you, honestly, they're probably grumpy and mean to the Father. And they may not realize it. A lot of people don't realize how they act. Uh, I know of one particular gentleman who's just always got to have his way, and he, I wasn't looking at you, but he's, he's just always got to have his way, and he snaps at you and barks orders. Well, his wife finally said to him one day, she said, and they hadn't been married all that long, although they were an older couple, they hadn't been married all that long, and she said to him, you got to quit barking orders all the time. That sounds mean and rude. Well, the reality is, is he was really a nice guy, he didn't realize what he was doing. And as soon as he realized what he was doing, he backed off. Well, it is true that sometimes we act in ways we don't realize we're acting. But we have a responsibility to act the way God wants us to act, whether we realize it or not. Now let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 12.25. 1 Corinthians 12.25. Now there's a word here called schism in this verse. Schism means division. Means division. 1 Corinthians 12, 25 says that there should be no schism, no division in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. You see that? And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now, you are the body of Christ and members individually. Now, the reality is you're a part of the body of Christ, right? But, and I say this respectfully, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, Lord, but you don't want to be a wart on the body of Christ. Well, that just didn't come out too good, did it? But... <laughs> But the reality is, as the body of Christ, you, you need to be you need to be the way Christ is. As a part of his body, you need to reflect how he is. And so many people um, in their relationships, in their marriages, with their friends and their family, they they don't realize they need to develop these relationships so that they're good. I mean we have a we have a group called, what, Divorce Care. And that is partially, part of that is developing your ability to have a relationship and have a correct relationship, or if someone has done you wrong, how to not let that soured relationship affect all your future relationships. See, sometimes people are so connected to the past that they can't move on into the future. You know, we need to understand that the past is gone. Yesterday's gone. And there's nothing you can really do to change yesterday. Uh, Jesus said in John 15, 4, he said, Abide in me, and I in you. 
As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Then he goes on to say, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. So he's basically telling us here that the fruit of the Spirit, you know, that we have in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit that is love, joy, peace, gentleness, kindness, what is it, patience, self-control. There's nine parts of the fruit of the Spirit. That is the character of God. That's his character. And, and he is the vine. Now, if we want that character, we've got to be connected to the vine. We're the branches. And without him, we can't have that character. Now, here's, here's the thing. As a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, and you are connected. Now, if you're not living like you're connected, it's not his fault. And something needs to change. Let me ask you this. Is it Jesus that needs to change? You know, does Jesus just need to change his personality? Or does the branch that's connected to him need to change a little bit? See, a lot of people feel that uh, Christianity is a religion, but it's not a religion. Christianity is, is the only group of people that are actually connected to the one true God. It's about a relationship between God and his people. We must always remember that every religion on earth, every religion on earth, requires the followers of that religion to sacrifice to the God. But we have the only relationship where our God loved us so much, he sacrificed for us. That's what makes our relationship with our God different. He loves us so much, he sacrificed for us. Well, that, that's a great love. You know, even though it's God's will that Christians live together in harmony, you know, too many Christians are separated and, and divorced from each other. You know, divorce just doesn't happen between a man and a woman who are married and then they go down to the courthouse and get a divorce. You can be... You can get divorced from your church family. You can get divorced from your friends. And the word divorce actually should not be in our, our Christian makeup. That word shouldn't be in our dictionary. Although, keeping everything in balance, we must also recognize this, that the Scripture does tell us that there are times when you are supposed to separate yourself. And sometimes Christians will use the excuse that the Bible says to avoid certain people, will use that excuse to avoid people they're not supposed to avoid. The reality is, if we're connected, we'll know who to, who to cling to and we'll know who to let go of. The good news is you can, you can take positive steps to heal relationships. And you can go to the family reunion this Christmas without hitting Aunt Agnes with a frying pan. You can do it. It's possible. Now, we all know that Aunt Agnes has got a mouth on her, and it never stops. And she tells rumors about everybody in the family privately to each person. When she's talking to you, she's talking about Uncle Harry. When she's talking to Uncle Harry, she's talking about you. And everybody knows it. So how do you deal with somebody like this? I mean, what, scripturally, what are you supposed to do? Well, um, some of these things must not, may not sound uh, very spiritual, okay? But a lot of the things that uh, the Bible talks about really don't sound too spiritual. They're, they're actually pretty practical. You know, the, uh, the Bible says this. Here's the Bible's welfare plan. If 
you don't work, you don't eat. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's kind of the Bible welfare plan. Um, you want to have friends? You better show yourself friendly. I mean, there's, there's principles in the Word of God that may not seem real spiritual, but they affect your life because they affect your relationships. Now see, like these four young ladies on the front row up here, they all must like each other. You know, they smile, they look at each other's notes, and you know, they're kind of point at each other and everything every now and then, and they all laugh together. When one laughs, they all laugh. When one gets quiet, they all get quiet. Well, you know, it's good to have friends and relationships like that. There's nothing wrong with it. You know, sometimes I've heard people say, well, at that church, they just have a clique. Well, what is a clique? It's a bunch of people that like each other and they click. Yeah, you don't like the click? Well, form a click. You know, have you ever stopped to think why you don't click with the click? Maybe it's because you're mean. You know what I'm saying? There's some, there's some practical things. You know, there's nothing wrong. I, I'm not talking about you because you're sitting over there by yourself. And, you know, it's, you know, I don't mean you don't have any friends. But why are you sitting by yourself? See, no, that's, that's, just, that's a joke. That's a joke. Um, <laughs> see, the people watching, they don't know who I'm pointing at. Okay, but here, here's, there's some practical things. You want to have good relationships? you got to decide some things. I'm gonna, I want to give you some things to decide on. Uh, number one, you got to decide to commit. Now, I'm not talking about to commit Aunt Agnes to a institution. <laughs> I've decided to commit. Who are you going to commit? <laughs> I'm going to commit Aunt Agnes to the asylum. No, you you got to decide some things. Um, with marriage, I mean, Ron, how many years were you married until Shirley passed? 61 years. Now, I've known both of them for a lot of years, for about 40 years. And I can tell you this, Shirley deserves a gold star by her name in heaven. <laughs> and so do you. I, you know, I, I, I've, kn I've known the two of them. They, they, they love each other, you know. And she may be in heaven. She, she's not dead. She's, she just changed locations. She left you for another man, for Jesus, you know. <laughs> but, but you'll see her again. And, uh, but the reality is if you're married for 60 years, you've got to make some commitments because I can guarantee you over 60 years, you're going to have some, some disagreements. But you have to decide whether or not you're going to let that disagreement destroy a relationship. Now, granted, once again, and I, I can't emphasize this enough, it takes two people. You know, in a marriage, it takes two people. If, if one person says to themselves out loud or however, if they say, or if they will not commit, uh, you can't manipulate them and you can't control them. The Bible, if you try to, that's witchcraft. And sometimes a person is left alone because of a crazy person. But life's not over. I said life's not over. And I know of Dozens, if not a hundred or so cases of people who it looked like their life was over and they're the happiest person in the world right now. Like Bob Yandian said, is God through with you? If you're wondering, just put your hand on your heart. Your heart's beating. No, he's not through with you. But you've got to commit. What do you, what do you need to commit? Well, of course, we talk about marriage, but salvation is forever. You can't just decide, well, I'm going to try church and see how it works. Health is forever. God is forever. You've got to decide, you know what? I'm going to, and not this church, but whatever church. You know, we've got people watching from who knows how many churches. But you've got to make a decision. If God told you to go to a church, you don't quit that church because somebody sat in your chair. You don't quit that church because somebody parked in your parking spot. You don't quit that church because the pastor didn't eat your casserole. 
and you knew that he wanted it, but he just out of spite walked in. No. People, you, you got to understand that if you want to have a relationship in a church, there's going to be some bumps in the road. I've heard of people that have gone to church for 30 or 40 years with the same church. And, and people look at them and go, like, wow, that's crazy. Nobody can go to a church that long. Well, you can if you've decided not to get offended. If the word of God's being taught, I said if the word of God's being taught, then stay. And if you got 10 people sitting around you and they're all idiots, what's that got to do with your relationship between you and God? Just, I mean, it, it's about you and God, right? You know, I know of a situation where a family went to a church and, and their, their child literally had a, uh, a had an illness and a handicap that just, well, it, it would have been something that would have hindered them through their whole life. And at that church, and I know this to be true, at that church, the child was healed. I said the child was healed physically, emotionally, and I'm to where they did not have the handicap anymore. I said the child was healed. And uh, about two years after the child was healed, the family just pulled up and went to another church. They went to another church that really didn't teach the word, didn't teach healing, didn't necessarily believe in healing. They had another child that had something happen, and the child just stayed that way. Well, why did the child stay that way? Because they were going to a church that did not believe in healing, that did not believe in the supernatural power of God. They taught the word, but they didn't teach all the word. But because of the parents, I'll just be honest with you, because of their stubbornness, they wouldn't go back to the church where their first child was healed. even though the first church believed in the supernatural power of the healing healing power of God. See, pride can get in the way. Well, why did they leave anyway? Because they weren't asked to be on a certain committee. There was a committee for something, actually it was quite minor in the church, and they weren't asked to be on that committee. And they thought to themselves, well, if that's the way they're going to treat us, we will just take our attendance and our tithe and we'll just go someplace else. And they did. But see, you shouldn't base, see, commitment in anything should not be based on offense. It needs to be, your commitment needs to be based on a truth. You, you find, when it comes to honoring the things of God, you find some place that preaches the word and you stay, if everybody in the church leaves and you're the last one, if the word of God's being preached and you're growing in faith, then why quit? Well, everybody else is leaving. Well, my mama used to tell me, well, if everybody else jumped off the cliff in your class, would you? Well, I had to think about that when she asked me that because if all the popular kids jumped off, I might have. You know. But that's, that's immaturity. A mature person is not led by their feelings, they're led by their commitment. See, commitment is a major part in growing up or maturing. Without commitment, I'll just tell you this right now, without commitment, you don't grow up. See, Michael said that God spoke to him. And he knew that he knew that he knew that he was supposed to be playing drums at the church. We knew God was calling somebody to play the drums because we had several good drummers in the church who could have been the drummer. But God spoke to my heart and says, no, leave the drums alone. Don't let anybody play drums. I couldn't figure out why. But it was because God was speaking to you and saying, play drums. Now, how many miles away from here do you live? 
40 or 40 or 45 yeah boy this is a Thursday night when the temperature outside is probably 20 and he's here see now why is he here the word is commitment see and if God tells you to do something then you do it you don't just do it when the sun's shining you you do it and if you want to have relationships with your family, you want to get along good with anybody, you need to have some commitment in your life. See, if you don't commit, you don't grow, you remain as a child. And as a child, as a spiritual child, you're tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine and by every feeling that comes along. All right. Second thing is, is you've got to decide. Number two is, and... Some of these points we have gone through before, but I'll tell you what, there's just a fresh, a fresh anointing from God on, on these. You know what I'm talking about? There, there's something fresh happening here. Um, when I was going through these points today, I, uh, I always asked the Lord this, you know. You know, I said, I, you know, I've talked about some of these things before, and I get this in my, in my heart. You know, it's like, well... It's kind of like John 3.16. You don't read it once and say, hey, well, I'm never reading that again. I read that once. You know, we, we need to meditate and absorb and, and receive. Uh, number two, you've got to decide how to handle problems maturely. You've got to decide to handle them maturely. You cannot be a child when it comes to problems. And it, it gets down to as simple as this. If somebody slaps you or says something rude to you, how does a child handle it? They slap back or they get rude back. Yeah, no. Hey, you're fat. Well, I can get over fat, but you can't get over ugly. You know, I mean, <laughs> you know, you know what I'm saying? Immature kind of wants to get back. It's always trying to get back. Well, you got to know that problems are going to come in life, and you cannot expect a fairy tale existence. James 1, 2 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you encounter various trials. It doesn't say if you encounter a trial. It says when you encounter a trial. In other words, they're going to come. Psalm 34, 19 says, many are the afflictions of the righteous. In Psalm 34, 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Then it goes on to say, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Yeah, we know we get delivered, but you've got to understand you get delivered out of something. Out of what? Afflictions. Well, who gets those? The righteous. How many do they get? Many. Oh, that doesn't sound like too good of a promise. Well, the good promise is the last part of the verse. He delivers you out of them all. So you got to understand this, if you want to be mature, that life has a lot of ups and downs, and Satan is continually working against you. Satan doesn't go on vacation, all right? Until Jesus returns, you're going to be going down the road of life, and there's going to be bumps in the road. Now, success or failure in a relationship doesn't depend upon whether you have a problem. It depends upon how you handle the problem you have. All right? Number three, take responsibility. Quit blaming everybody else for the mess up you made. Quit blaming the devil. Sometimes the devil didn't have anything to do with it because you were doing too good of a job at it. You know, the devil stepped back and says, I don't want to do anything because I might mess it up. Okay, that was funny when I thought of it. But uh, sometimes people blame God for what happens. Well, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Well, read that in context. The Lord giveth, but he didn't take that child because he needed another flower in heaven. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, Examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith. 
test yourself. Let's see if we can put that verse up there. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. There you go. Examine yourself. <laughs> see, most people see this scripture and they read it this way. Examine others as to see whether they are in the faith. Test others. <laughs> no. Examine yourself. And when you examine yourself, take responsibility for what you find. Don't ignore what you find. Of course, Matthew 7, 3 talks about the speck. You know, you don't look at the speck in somebody else's eye when you've got a wood plank in your own. See, if you can admit blame, then that means you are a teachable person. When this church first started, Loretta's prayer was this, Lord, send us the hungry, the humble, and the teachable. That's you guys. That's what you are. You're the hungry, the humble, and the teachable. If, it doesn't matter if you have a church of 2,000 people. If they're not teachable, what have you got? I would rather have 10 people in the church. I'd rather have a church service and only 10 comes into the entire auditorium if they're teachable than to have 2,000 that are not teachable. See, it's not about how many. It's not about the quantity. It's about the quality. The Bible says that 12 men, the, the apostles of the Lamb, turned the world upside down. And one of those was a goofball that hung himself. I mean, the reality is a few good people can change the world. Take responsibility. Be doers of the word. James 1.22, be doers of the word and not hearers only. Because if you're a hearer only, it says you deceive yourself. Number four, spend some time together. If you don't know someone, you can't judge them. If you don't know them, you can't make a determination about what they're doing is right. See, sometimes people do things and you, you criticize, but you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. You find out what's going on behind the scenes, and all of a sudden you have this, oh, my goodness, I'm sorry, I didn't know. Well, how, how can you judge somebody properly? You know, Jesus said in uh, John, the 15th chapter, verse 4, he said, abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Remember that verse? you gotta, you got to stay connected got to stay connected. And here's, here's something for you. If the only time you ever see Aunt Edith is at the family reunion, and you only go to every other year's family reunion, and you see her doing something or saying something that you don't like, shut up. Zip it up. Keep your mouth closed. You don't know her. You have no idea. You know, I had a, a relative one time many, many years ago and he was grumpy, grumpy. He was an older gentleman and uh, a little bit younger than I am now. But, <laughs> but he was suffering from chronic pain. And the doctors could not find out what the problem was, and there was no medication to relieve the pain. Now, I don't know about you, but when you have got pain, and, and you are hurting so much that your eyes are watering most of the time. You may not be Mr. Cheerful or Miss Happy-Go-Lucky around everybody. Now, granted, you need to deal with the pain, get the pain. There's, there's all kinds of things entering into this. But you don't know. You don't know. Once I felt, found out what was going on with this gentleman, um, in our family, it made me realize, my goodness, if I had that kind of pain, maybe I would be that grouchy. Of course, I wouldn't be. But I'm just a happy guy. Okay. If you want to have a relationship with somebody, you got to spend time together. Now, this, this kind of goes into even husbands and wives. This, this gets into neighbors. Um, there may be neighbors you don't want to have a relationship with. And that's okay. That's okay. Um, I have a house on either side of me in the subdivision I'm in. 
I've lived there for 12 years. I don't know the first or last name of the people on either side. And if I ran into them in the grocery store, I wouldn't recognize them. Why is that? I'm never home. And they live different lives, and I don't know what they do. I don't know where they travel to. Now, for me to try to have a relationship with somebody I don't know, I, I probably could. I could go over and knock on the door and try to develop some kind of a relationship. But the reality is I'm having trouble keeping up with all the relationships I already have. And if I had some extra time, you know, I'd spend it with him <laughs> or him or him. Y y you know what I'm saying. So don't get mad at yourself if there are people you don't have a relationship with. But you know what I'm talking about. If, if you don't get along with your brother-in-law, how long has it been since you've been to your brother-in-law's house? Maybe he doesn't want you at his house. Which you need to decide who is it that God wants you to have a relationship with. Spending time together. You can work and work and work at spending time together with somebody to have a relationship with them, but if God doesn't want you to have a relationship with them, it will be futile. So when it comes to spending time together, you need to ask yourself this. Who is it God wants me to have a relationship with? There are people, when it comes to spending time together, that can waste your time. If the devil can get somebody that is never going to change, ever, go, ever, ever going to change, and get you to minister to them and spend all your time trying to minister to them, and they're never going to change. Because you're ministering in the flesh because you're trying to prove a point. You're going to get that person saved. But down through the corridors of time, God could see that they're not going to receive them. See, they have freedom of choice, but still, God has freedom of traveling through time. And even though they have a choice to make, and it's 100% their choice, God knows, in the end, how they're going to choose. And he will not put you in charge of developing a relationship and wasting a lot of time on somebody that's never going to change. Now, I know that doesn't sound right to some people, but meditate on that. It, it's kind of like the 80-20 principle in school. You know, in school, years ago, um, a teacher would spend 80% of her time on 20% of the students. And good students would get neglected because bad students, they spent all the time on them. And I would suggest that maybe the statistic is even greater than that. They spend 95% of their time on 5% of the students. Find out who God wants you to have a relationship with, but when you find it out, you've got to develop some type of time together. Um, you know, there was a study one time, and uh, it said it takes 15 hours alone together a week for a man and a woman to fall in love. Okay, are you following me here? Just... A date every now and then, a little dabble, do you? Usually doesn't cause you to fall in love. You've got to spend some time together. The same study said it takes 15 hours a week after you get married to maintain that relationship. How many hours a week do you spend with your spouse? Generally speaking, you take away the time, you take away the love. And the same thing goes for you spiritually. You want to develop a relationship with God? You cannot never meditate on his word. You cannot never spend time praying and praying in the spirit. You cannot ignore God and expect a relationship. You say, well, I go to church. Okay, there's one hour a week. It takes more time than that. You want to develop a relationship with God. And I'm not just talking about praying over your food. You know, bless this food, bless this meat. I'm getting hungry. Come on, let's eat. You know, um, it takes time. 
Now, I wouldn't suggest that the dinner table would be a good time. Loretta's mother was good at that. She'd cook a good hot meal, and then she'd pray. Then we'd eat the cold meal. <laughs> there were no short prayers. Okay. Uh, let's, number five. I'm going to have to move right along here. Uh, communication. Romans 10, 17. You know, when it comes to, to our relationship with God, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And that word hearing there is continuous. In the, in the Greek, um, it, it means hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. So then faith doesn't come by having heard. Faith comes by hearing. If you want to have a relationship with God, Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith it's impossible to please him. So what's that mean? That means you want to please God, you want to have a relationship with him, you've got to have faith. How do you get faith? Faith comes by hearing and hearing. How do you hear? Through the word of God. Because without faith it's impossible to please him. I mean, this, this is a big deal. Faith is important. Faith is something that needs to be constant all the time. What is faith? Faith is simply, in its simplest form, is just believing God. So how much of the time do you believe God? you got to believe him all the time. It's not, a, I believe him today and I don't tomorrow. You say, well, I do believe him. Well, we're talking about communication. What do you say? You say, Father, I've got this problem with my whatever. I've got this problem with my leg. I've got this problem with a kidney. I've got this problem with whatever. And, Father, I believe that your word is true. Your word says in 1 Peter 2.24 that by the stripes of Jesus I have been healed. Your word says that if I ask for anything that's your will, you'll give it to me. And I know it's your will that I be healed because Psalm 103.3 says, You are the Lord my God who heals me. You bring healing. You don't bring sickness. You bring healing. So, Father, I'm asking now and believing. And I'm calling those things that be not as though they are, as you say to do. And I'm saying, I am healed. Ring. Hello? Yeah, yeah. Sure, you can go ahead. Yeah, get everybody praying for me. Yeah, cause you're right. I need healing. Yeah. Oh, you get them praying. You you get everybody praying. You can. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. Oh, I've been suffering a long time, and I'm believing. I'm standing in faith. No, you're not. If you're standing in faith, you would have believed that God did what He said He would do. God says, "You ask, I'll give it to you." So you ask. Well, maybe He gave it to me, and maybe He didn't. No. See, faith. You want a relationship with God, you've got to start believing what he says. How would it be, how, the Garretts, how long have you been married? Fif 15, 16 years, you really should know. <laughs> it's, if you don't know, let her answer, okay? <laughs> you know, just, oh, go ahead, honey, tell him, you know. <laughs> um, but... Uh, wouldn't it be damaging to your relationship if you came home, you say you were out wherever, you went to Walmart to get something, and something really weird happened at Walmart. I mean, I don't know why, but something, something weird always happening at Walmart. But something strange happened. You saw something in the parking lot that's just like unbelievable. So you go home, and you say, well, you know, I was up at Walmart, and a weird thing happened. And you tell her this weird thing to happen, she goes, I don't know if I really believe that or not. He said, no, I saw it with my own eyes. Well, I know what you think you saw. No, really, I did. Uh, whatever. How would that make, how would that enhance your relationship? I mean, if that kind of thing was going on all the time, it would not enhance your relationship. I mean, it, it, it starts dividing your relationship because people are looking for somebody that believes them. Well, see, this is why the Scripture says, without faith it's impossible to please God. God is pleased when we believe what he said. Well, what did he say? Well, he said that Jesus was made poor so that we could have prosperity. Well, I don't really believe Christians should have any money. Well, there you go. You don't believe God. Well, let's pray and see if God will heal us. <laughs> Believing God is essential in our communication with God. Wow. 
So, what are the two biggest, now I, I don't know if you, I'm not going to put you on the spot, you know, um, but when we talk about communication, there's two things, see I got a PhD, that stands for past having death, or post hole digger, I'm not really sure which, and I've got a small degree in um, psychology. Okay, and in one of the books I have, it says that there are two things that are the biggest causes of divorce. Now, since you're into divorce care, I'm not going to put you on the spot and see if you've come up with the same two things. But my book said that it's sex and money. Now, you probably wouldn't have said that because you didn't want to say sex in church. But uh, the two biggest causes are sex and money. And the reality is it's a shortage of either one that causes it. That was humor, but it's true. Okay. What causes the problems when it comes to sex and money in a relationship? It all comes back to communication. It all comes back to communication. If there's a shortage of money and one of them tries to hide it, or a shortage of money and one of them, you won't communicate. When there's, when there's a shortage of money, couples tend to not communicate. A lack of communication breaks a relationship. Okay, number six. You've got to have this attitude of putting the other people first. Hmm. That's called friendship. Happy couples are friends with each other. Now, also in my psychology book, we were taught that uh, the best relationships are where you start out and your relationship is built on friendship. You know, you were friends for a while. Then you got together as lovers. Because sometimes people get together as lovers and then they find out they can't live as friends. So, friendship is putting somebody else first. If you, if you have a friend, you'll always put them first. You know, if you, you can just see it in people where they put somebody else first. Um, I can see it, you know, you've got this husband and wife and they're sitting down and there's just, they're eating breakfast together and there's only one biscuit left. And it's like that biscuit goes to waste because neither one of them wants to be the person to eat the last one. They want the other person to have it. Y you know what I'm saying? So, but in case you had breakfast this morning with your spouse and they gobbled down the last biscuit, that doesn't mean that there's something wrong with them. But uh, don't be selfish. You know, in uh, Philemon, no, I'm not going to use that verse. Never mind. Let's go to the next one. Or I'm running short on time here. Uh, number seven, you've got to have an, a mental understanding we are connected. You are connected. If, if it's a family relationship, you need to understand that the people in your family, you're connected to them. If you're a cousin, you're connected. There is a connection that cannot be broken. If it's your uncle, there's a connection. And you have to understand that if you're married, that's a connection. If you're going to church, that's a connection. See, I'm connected to Mark. I am connected to him. I may be the pastor, but I'm also a church member here. I don't know if you knew that or not. But we are connected. How are we connected? We are operating in the same local body with the same goals to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ to this community and to the world. We're connected. And it doesn't mean, now, now don't take this wrong. I do like you. You are my friend. But this is just an illustration. It doesn't mean that you have to be best friends and hang out with everybody in the church. Are you following me? Don't feel bad if somebody in the church doesn't hang out with you because we are all different in a lot of ways. I mean, some people like country western music. Some people like rock and roll. Some people like classic. Do you know what I'm saying? Uh, and 
what, what happens is you find things that you do like about people, and those become connections, you know. Well, since I mentioned Mark, I just mentioned one little connection. He, he made me a chess set. I don't know if he wanted me to publicly say that or not, but he, he physically made a phenomenal chess set. I've got it up in my office right now because he knew I like chess. I like to play chess. I don't get to play as often as I like, but I, I love to play chess. I've even got books where I study chess moves. Now, that will make nobody want to be my friend. You know, you think, boy, that guy's mental. But that, that's a connection, see? And we all have connections. You know, go right back there, Joyce. Joyce and I have connections. Uh, the very first book I ever published was 25 years ago. And Joyce and her husband volunteered and went to the publishers to where they were printing the books and actually helped fold and sort pages in my very first book. And then Joyce works in our bookstore. She likes books. I like books. She, I mean, you probably figured that out. I love to read. I like, a, I like a good book. I don't like a bad book, but I like good books. And we can go around the room. Dave likes music. I mean, you go around the room, and I have a connection with everybody, and so do you. But it may not be the same connection, but it doesn't mean that you have to be a certain way. It's just we all, but what you do have to do is you've got to love everybody. You, you see what I mean? And um, because you understand, we're all, this is a fellowship. And you know the old phrase where it came from, a fellowship, that word came from back in old English times. They had a bunch of fellows out on a ship. And if you got a bunch of fellows on a ship crossing the ocean, they got to get along. And when, if, if they're oaring, you got to be oaring together. You know what I'm saying? And so you have a, a bunch of fellows in a ship. they got to get along. Well, we're a fellowship. We have to get along. I mean, you got to love me whether you want to or not. I was hoping there had been more laughter on that. But <laughs> so you got to understand we are connected. And, uh, you know, the Bible talks about how we are joint heirs with Jesus, but we are all joint heirs with Jesus which makes us joint heirs with each other. And we are heirs, not heirers. Okay? So we're connected. Now, you also have to realize if you want to have any kind of relationship at all in your family or in your church, uh, there are times when you've got to nurture the relationship. Um, in a marriage relationship, whether it's lovemaking or carrying out the garbage. Well, I'm not going to go any further with that. Uh, <laughs> so, um, at any rate, I think you all know the rest of that story. But um, to nurture our relationships simply means that you have to do your part, and you've got to let go of grudges. You've got to let go of the little things. Somebody didn't let me do something. I wanted to run the soundboard in the auditorium at church, but pastor told me they already had somebody running the soundboard at church, and I could probably do a better job, but if that's the way they feel about me, I'm just not going to do anything. Now, you don't develop a relationship that way in church, or in your family. Well, I tried doing something good for those kids. I helped them out, but they didn't appreciate it, so from now on, they're on their own. <laughs> well, you know, most kids only have half a brain anyway. Right? So you just, if you're a parent, it doesn't matter how old you are or they are, you're just going to help them out the rest of your life. Just settle in on it. That's what parents do. Just like tonight. Let's get personal here. In 1977, we were going to have a Bible study at our house. And you, you came to several Bible studies at our house. We've got several ministers here at the Lake of the Ozarks that got saved 
at the Bible studies at our house. I mean, they were just, they were phenomenal. Um, <laughs> we had nuns, we had the pastors from the, I said pastors, we had the pastors from the uh, Methodist church on the other side of the lake come. One guy came and he got filled with the Holy Spirit, the pastor, and they fired him. He went back up and tried preaching at Eddie's church, and they fired him. And then I ran in, I was at G2M supermarket, and I ran into a, a guy, and he says, are you Larry Ellison? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, my name's so-and-so. I'm the new pastor at the Methodist church. They told me to stay away from you. I said, well, okay. I said, am I standing too close? <laughs> he said, no, you're okay. He said, I understand you have Bible studies down at your house. I said, yeah, we do. So he started coming to Bible studies at our house. He got spirit-filled, and they kicked him out. So, but at any rate, we, uh, you know, we had Bible studies at our house. But one Bible study in 1977, uh, we only had like six or eight people show up at this Bible study. And somebody said, you know, I understand there's a new movie coming out tonight. I said, really? What is it? He said, Star Wars going to be playing up at the Laurie Terrace Mall Theater. I said, Star Wars, what's it about? And they said, well, it's a science fiction space movie. So we all looked at each other and said, hey, we can have our Bible study tomorrow night. Let's all go to Star Wars. So we all went and got in our cars, and we went to Star Wars. Now, Robbie was a little kid back then. So we piled him in the car, and we went to the premiere opening of Star Wars. And all of Robbie's life, he's remembered how he, how his dad took him to the premiere of Star Wars. Well, today is the premiere of the new Star Wars movie down at Lake Cinema that Disney just came out with. So Robbie went online, and he bought a ticket for his son online. And he's telling me today that he bought a ticket for his son online. And I said, well, Robbie... Are you going to go? He said, no. I'll never forget when you took me as a father. But no, I'm just going to let my son go alone because we've got church tonight. Gotta, Dad, I don't want to disappoint you. I'll be at church. <laughs> I said, Robbie, here's the deal. You can read your Bible and pray and study tomorrow night. How about tonight you take your son? I mean, it's... Now, somebody say, you mean you told your son, who is an associate pastor of the church, to take his son and go see Star Wars? Yes, I did. It's okay. I mean, we don't have to send him down to see Star Wars, and then all of a sudden everybody hide it because it's not spiritual. Well, you know, Star Wars, that's not true. Well, there's a lot of television shows you see that aren't true. But if they're fun and they're a family bonding thing, you know. So um, find common goals. You know, fi find some place where you can connect. So the reality is, now Robbie told his son, when I was your age, my dad took me to the opening, the grand opening of the Star Wars. See, now grandson has a connection with grandpa. We all went to the Grand... That was interesting over there, when, which, by the way, the rest of the story is we went in and we saw Star Wars. I had no idea what it was, you know, Han Solo, Princess Leia. I had no idea. I went in and I saw Star Wars. We all walked out of the theater, stood outside. We looked at each other, all of the whole Bible study group. We said, let's watch it again. We went and all bought tickets and watched it a second time. It went right back in the, right back in the theater and watched it again. So it's okay to have fun. See, sometimes having fun can build a relationship. You want a relationship? Don't, now, now follow me on this. Don't get so, you can't get too spiritual. I, I do not like the phrase where people say so spiritual that they're no earthly good. You know, they're, they're so heavenly minded they're no earthly good. I don't like that because I think we should be heavenly minded. But here's the thing. You can become so religious, something. You can become so religious that you can mess up your family. Well, we're not going to, I know you kids were wanting to do this and watch this special Christmas television show tonight, but we're not watching that show tonight. Tonight, what we're going to do is I'm going to give you a Bible study on the book of Acts. Well, if God told you to do that, fine. You know what I mean? 
But the reality is, let's, let's get real. You can do the Bible study after the movie. You know, don't turn your family against you and use, don't make God be the bad person. Because the kids, kids start thinking, well, it's another one of those Jesus things. No. God is the God of love. The scripture even says that Jesus, now listen to this, Jesus got in the boat to get away from the people. When he was out in the boat and he preached from the boat that time, he didn't get in the boat to preach. The Bible says he got in the boat to get away from the people. So next time you guys see me in a boat, <laughs> leave me alone. <laughs> ah, I love it. Okay. So find common goals. That, that's important. Um, nurture the relationship was number eight. Find common goals. Uh, where's number nine? Be willing to adjust. That's number nine. Number nine, be willing to adjust. It's okay to compromise sometimes. You don't compromise on the word, but you can compromise on things sometimes. This sounds so practical. But, you know, you like steak and your spouse likes chicken. Well, sometimes go to the chicken restaurant. It's okay. Compromise a little bit. You don't have to have your way all the time. Hmm. You know, if you're looking for the perfect church, you need to compromise a little bit. Because if you're looking for the perfect church, just don't join it. Because then it won't be. Ephesians, let me give you a scripture so that you can. Ephesians 4.32, be kind to one another. Tenderhearted. Forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. Number 10, that takes us up to number 10. Walk in forgiveness. Healthy relationships, I'm not going to say a whole lot about this because I think you all know what forgiveness is. But let's just put it this way. Healthy relationships don't keep score. I'm just going to mark that down. Yep, I'm not going to say anything about it right now. I'm going to keep that one in my hip pocket. And when the time's right, I'm going to slap it out on the table and I'm going to, I'm going to let it be known. No. I, 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 you want a healthy relationship, you're going to have to forget some stuff. If you sleep with somebody that snores, get earplugs. Don't get a new spouse. They probably snore too. And most of the time what you do is you exchange somebody that snores for somebody that belches. You know, you, you, may, you may think you're making an upgrade, but you'll find out later, you know, and then you, you trade the belcher for somebody that... <coughs> you know, so, hey, what's bad is when you get somebody that snores, belches, and, <coughs> and they all at the same time. It happens. I'm sure it does. But compromise. Get some earplugs. It's okay. Okay. Now I remember why I didn't put that in my notes. Okay. And uh, what, what number was that? That was number 10. 10, walk in forgiveness. Don't keep score. Number 11, find some common goals. Um. You know, you should have found some common goals before you got married. And you should find some common goals before you join the church. And you should find some common goals before you move into the neighborhood. I know of a guy who hates golf. I mean, he hates it. He considers it the slowest, stupidest game in the world. He said, I would rather watch grass grow as to watch a golf game on television golf, whatever it is. Well, this guy on the other side of the lake, this is a true story, this guy on the other side of the lake, he bought a house on the golf course. And then the first time, and it happened, the first time, and it's happened more than two or three, the 
first time that his living room window was shattered with a golf ball. The first time. He calls me and complains to me. I mean, I know the guy. I've known him for years. He calls me and complains. He gripes over the phone. Now, he's telling me in kind of a funny way, but he's really, I said, are you an idiot? I mean, I told him, I, I can talk to him this way. I said, are you, what, are you an idiot? You hate golf. You know the golf course right out of Laurie. You know which one I'm talking about, don't it? He said, why did you buy a house? Well, it was a good deal. You know, sometimes you just need common sense. If you hate golf, don't buy a house in the middle of a subdivision that's filled with golfers. You're, you're going to have a, a community picnic. You're not going to have anything to talk about with all those guys because they all love golf so much they bought a house on a golf course. You bought a house because it was a good deal. You know, you've uh, got to use some common sense on finding common goals. And that kind of goes with churches. Our church... You know, we're not a huge church, but we're an international church. I, I talked with a pastor today up in Wisconsin. They're getting ready to start a study course next week on one of our books. We shipped them up some books. Well, Wisconsin? Well, yeah, Wisconsin, because our, we reach out that far. So our church, you know, if, if you just want a church where it's just me and Pa and the, and the kids and we just kind of like have a, fellowship dinner every every other Wednesday night and just kind of sit around and talk. This isn't the church. You know, we've got a, a far-reaching vision. You know, it, it's, it's, not, it's not the amount of people you have in a church. It's how many people do you touch in a week. You know, and now we're, we're getting on Apple TV and, and uh, Roku. I mean, I'm telling you, Roku, we... <laughs> We get a lot of people watching on Roku, and we over 14 million possible viewers. And uh, we got some other things going on, too, that we're going to get going here in the next few weeks. But find some common goals. It, you know, if, if you are a city boy, don't join the cowboy church. I, I'm telling you, you'll feel out of place. Amos 3.3 3 says, can two walk together unless they be agreed? You want to walk together with somebody, you need to find somebody. Why do the musicians all hang out together? Every now and then you see the musicians all on Facebook, all eating together. And then they've got Jimmy with them. I don't know how that. But, <laughs> but why is that? It's because what, what's common there? They all like music. They all like music. And if they can't sing, they like people who do. You know what I'm saying? It's just look. Find common goals. You want relationships? Find common goals. And you can. Um, and then number 12, I'm just going to say this. Um, don't give up. You want to have any kind of relationship at all, you don't give up. Uh, I will say this. Uh, in my own life, I know how weird I am. Or, no, that's... I know how weird I've been. Okay, I know how weird I am and how weird I've been. Okay, I know. And it's amazing to me that anybody likes me. But people haven't given up on me. You guys didn't give up. In fact, one of you told me the other day, just one of these days we know we're going to hear a good sermon. <laughs> yeah, don't tell them what you know. But... <laughs> But, you know, but the reality is we're in this together. As long as we're all getting fed and we got this common goals and it's not about big me or little you or big you and little me. It's we're all in this together. We're all moving the same direction. And when it comes, you know, remember back a few points earlier we said we're connected. There's, there's some connections. Let me tell you something. You're connected with your kids. And you're connected with your parents. You're connected. You're connected with your brothers and your sisters. You are connected. They may be dumbos, but you're connected. Now, here's the deal. That's a connection that can't be broken. So when it comes to those types of connections, number 12 is this. You don't give up. You never give up on a child. Never. 
You never give up on a child. You never give up on your parents. I know of a guy in the ministry that uh, his dad, when, when he went into the ministry, his dad said, you're, you're an idiot, and called him a whole bunch of curse words. And uh, for 25 years, this minister prayed for his dad. And every time he saw his dad at a family reunion, every time they met, it wouldn't be five minutes before the subject got off into your, you're into that crazy Jesus stuff, you know, and stay away. Don't talk to me about that, you know, and just really ridiculed him. And when his dad uh, was 80, I think it was 82 or 83, I got a call from this minister friend of mine. He lived in Australia. I got a call from him, and he said, he said, boy, I got some good news. I said, what's that? He said, my dad received Jesus. My dad received Jesus. He said, my dad, and his dad became a strong Christian. Well, you know, we got a lady in this church. I won't mention her name, but you all know her. And, and this is a, she gave this testimony publicly when we spoke down in Springfield this last month. She and her husband showed up. She has this lady and her husband. They're both doctors, okay? Uh, she has attended this church for how many years? 15, 20 years, something like that? What would you say, 15 or 20 years? And uh, she has two sons. They're both in the ministry. One Today, one's in Haiti as a missionary. One's in a Afghanistan doing work in Afghanistan. Uh, her husband is a Jew. Now, I love Jews. You all know how I, we love the Jewish people. But he's basically kind of been a bad person over the years, abusive to her. And um, he would come to church here. And as he told me, anytime we had a free meal, if we were eating down at the, having our annual picnic, he would show up. Have our annual fellowship dinner in here, he would show up. He was always polite to everybody. But he was, we would just put it this way, he was extremely difficult to live with, and probably a lot of women would have never stayed with him even remotely this long. His wife, strong Christian, he he wasn't a strong Jew. He was a Jew, but he, he was almost on the verge of being an atheist, and he made fun of the family. He made fun of the boys for being missionaries. He made fun of her, ridiculed her publicly. Last month, he got saved. I said last month, he got saved, and it was his son from Afghanistan that won him to the Lord. And they, they came here to the church they showed up right after this happened when I, we were speaking at, at the uh, Eschatology Club in Springfield two months ago, or a month and a half ago, I guess it was. They showed up as a couple. When it came time to give testimonies, we almost couldn't get him stopped. He loves Jesus. You know what I'm saying? He, he's over the top saved. His eyes have been opened. Now, here's the whole deal. She could have given up on him. The sons could have given up on their dad. But they didn't. And the result was, now, in all of this, there could have been a time when he left. Well, if he left, you can't do anything about that. But he didn't leave. As long as he didn't leave, they stayed strong in faith. They stayed strong in, in the word. Bottom line is, they didn't give up. And the result was, one more soul in the kingdom of God. Isn't God good? And God blessed them. They got a house in Springfield. It's just a mansion. They're moving in. They had bad financial problems. They were telling everybody about it. But God blessed them with a beautiful house in Springfield. See, God's good. So, meditate on these things. Look up the scriptures and uh, realize when you go to a family reunion or you go to a church fellowship dinner or any, anything that you're connected with where there's a group of people, you need to understand this. As far as God's concerned, it's not all about you. And we need to have this attitude. It's not all about me. But it's about how God can use me to minister and to heal relationships. And I can't be 
best pals with everybody. But I can have, I can be pleasant to everybody. And see, like when it comes to forgiveness, I know I've closed my Bible, but I have one more thing to say. When it comes to forgiveness, this is a point where people, there's two things. And uh, actually, these two things are something that the lady wanted to talk about tomorrow on that program out of Iowa. Uh, when somebody doesn't ask you for forgiveness, how can you forgive them if they don't ask for forgiveness? If somebody doesn't say, will you forgive me? Can you forgive them? The answer is yes, you can forgive them because it doesn't really have anything to do with them. You forgiving them has nothing to do with them. It all has to do with you getting it off your chest, clear, clearing your heart out, and so now you're free. You're free. You forgave them. You're free. See, it's, it's about your heart, not theirs. Well, what if they don't, what if they stay the same? That's irrelevant. You've forgiven them. You're okay. And then what, what about this? Uh, the next question is, is uh, so that means now i got to figure out some way that I've forgiven them. i got to figure out some way to be their friend. No. If somebody acts like a jerk around you and they're just obnoxious to you all the time and you forgive them, that doesn't mean you got to invite them out to church or out, out to eat after church next Sunday or invite them over to your house. No, you, you don't have to develop a relationship with somebody you forgive. You just need to forgive them, and the relationship you do have is that you walk in the fruit of the Spirit, and you're pleasant, you're kind, and... You know, you can be nice to people who are rude to you. You can be nice to people who are rude to you. I was, uh, well, since I started the sentence, I better finish it. Okay. I was standing in line at one of the local stores. And to be quite honest, I had my head in the clouds. I'm, I'm waiting in line to pay for something. I kind of got my head in the clouds. I'm thinking about something. Well, the person in front of me stepped up, and it left a little space between me and the person. There's a couple people waiting up there, but it left a little space. And so I hadn't stepped up yet. I was, I was thinking about something, and I felt this nudge on my shoulder, and I looked around, and there was a young man back there. Uh, he must have lost a lot of weight because his pants were kind of down a little bit. <laughs> and... And he must have had some problem with his arm because his hat was on crooked, and it was kind of... So, but at any rate, and I smiled at him. I just, oh, because he was wanting me to move. I, I smiled at him, and the guy flipped me the finger, standing right next to me. I mean, like, a foot from me. And he, I, he didn't think it was funny. I smiled. He did not think it was funny. Well, my flesh wanted to reach in his throat and grab his tonsils and wrap his head with his mouth, you know, just in love. Because I'm a pastor. <laughs> it has to be in love. <laughs> I mean, he was... Actually, I don't know why a kid would do something like that because I was probably outweighed him by 75 pounds or 100. And I could have I could have whacked him. I mean, I may be in my 60s, but I could have whacked him easy. But he didn't seem to care. Now, instantly, all 12 of these points plus 22 others flashed through my head. I mean, the first thing was, is you're a pastor, you're a pastor, you're a pastor. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking to myself, because, you know, I didn't want it to be in the paper, you know, pastor maims child. But I just, I mean, there I am. He, I'm standing there, and he's got his hand held up. And I just gave him a knowing smile and a nod and stepped forward. Now, when we got out to the parking lot, I sliced his tires. No. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that, that's, <laughs> that's not true. That's not true. My flesh wanted to. My, my flesh wanted to. Really. I wanted to follow him home. I wanted to just wait in my car and see where he went. 
He's probably some pastor's kid down the street. I don't know. But the reality is, is the world is watching. The world's watching you. And they're judging Jesus by how you react. And when you, if you can't keep at least your side of a relationship together, you go to the family reunion, they're watching you. You're the one who goes to church, and you got the Bible laying in the back seat of the car, and they all saw it as they walked in. Oh, there's, they see that. Now, they're watching you. And the devil will do everything he can to trip your trigger and get you to react. You just can't do it. You know, being a Christian's got to be a 24-7 thing. And it doesn't mean you're a wimp. Now, if the guy would have hit me, Yeah, yeah. When the Bible says turn the other cheek, it doesn't say which cheek. Um. <laughs> I mean, there there is a place. Now, now here's the difference. If he would have hit me, I probably would not have hit back. Honestly, if he would have just hit me hard on the shoulder or something, you, you bring up an interesting point. I probably would not have. But if he would have hit Loretta or my daughter, they probably would have had to carry him out. See, there's, there is a, there's a, as a Christian, it doesn't mean you're a wimp. You know, Jesus didn't get a, a whip and go into the temple and go, whippy, whippy, whippy. No. When he went in with a whip, they, you know what he did? The scripture says, and see, I've seen several Christian movies and they're all wrong. They, they, they see Jesus, he's in the temple, and he sees the money changers, and his eyes get big, and he, and he kind of gets crazed, and he r runs over, and there's a soldier there, and he grabs the whip from the soldier, and he starts beating everybody like a wild man. You know what the Bible says? He saw the money changers. He went home and braided a whip. Then he went back, and he took them out. Now, here's the deal. How long does it take to braid a whip? See, he, so there's a time when you stand up and you defend yourself, you defend your family, you know. There's a time when you do that. But there's also a time when you know who you are and some kid poking me on the shoulders, not, that doesn't hurt me. I'm bigger than to let some kid trip my trigger, you know. People try to run you off the road and they wave at you in that special way, you know. Yeah, you can get into road rage and chase them down the highway, what are you proving? What are you proving? It's a lot easier to just say, hey, I know who I am in Christ. I mean, <laughs> you may chase them down the road and they pull in at the church because they're volunteering that afternoon. Or you know, <laughs> you, you never know. You just don't know, do you? Father, in the name of Jesus, we love you. We praise your holy name. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the common sense lifestyle that you teach us in your word. Father, we thank you that you teach us how to live and how to live together and how to love and love together and love you. You tell us what it takes to please you. And Father, that's what it's all about. We want to be pleasers of you in your kingdom, following your rules, living your lifestyle so that others So that others, according to the scripture, your word says, let your light so shine before men that they'll see your good works and glorify you, Father. I speak the blessing over these people, over this congregation. I plead the blood of Jesus over them as they travel this evening. Bless them, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you all. Love you.